Okay, class, here we go. We continue with chapter eight, muscular system. Now we come to a topic where we're saying, okay, how do these muscles get energy? How do we get energy? Um, so let's dive a little bit deeper. Sometimes this is a little complicated for some students, but we'll try to go slow, try to take it one step at a time. I also have some handouts or step-by-step -step, uh, on Canvas as well that you can look at. But let's take a simple approach. Let's say that I want to just move for a little bit. You know, I just want to reach for a little bit, take a few steps. Well, your muscles have ATP stored in them. Very small amount, but that can give you a little bit of energy, maybe three to six seconds. Right? So think of something that you do for three to six seconds. Well, you have this ATP that's kind of floating around that can give you that energy. But if you move longer than that, you're like, okay, well, what am I going to get my uh, source from? Where do I get this energy? Well, you also have something called creatine phosphate. And I'm sure you've heard of this, uh, uh, you know, if you work out. Uh, but creatine phosphate is available because what you have in the muscles, you don't have as much ATP, but you have something called ADP. And because ATP is not stable, it'll break down to ADP, and you've got a bunch of ADP just hanging out in your muscles. But in order for us to use energy, we need ATP. So ATP is adenotriphosphate, where ADP is adenodiphosphate. So where do I get the extra phosphate from? From for ADP to convert to ATP. You're like, okay, this is getting a little complicated, but bear with me. Well, then that's where the magic happens, and creatine phosphate gives you that extra phosphate so that ADP, the two, becomes, if I take the phosphate from creatine and give it to ADP, then it becomes adenotriphosphate. There you go. Now, when creatine phosphate gives that phosphate to ADP and becomes ATP, it gives us energy for, you know, I want to say about 10, 10 seconds, 10, 15 seconds. So people that take creatine phosphate in the gym, well, that can extend their ability to go from 10 seconds, 15 seconds, maybe a little bit longer because they have that extra creatine phosphate in them. The research says that it doesn't matter when you take it, pre-workout, post-workout, or just anytime throughout the day, you will have that extra creatine phosphate in there. But what that allows you to do is maybe squeeze out an extra rep, squeeze out a few extra uh, reps so you can't just take creatine and say, I'm going to get bigger. You still have to work out, and you have to work out to fatigue, so it allows you to take a few extra steps. Uh, and by taking a few extra reps, then you'll get a little bit more muscle gain. So um, that's how creatine phosphate will work. Now, when creatine phosphate gives that extra phosphate to ADP, it produces a byproduct called creatinine, which is bad. So we want to flush that out. So we take the creatine back into the blood, back to the, the kidneys, and pee it out. Um, so sometimes in, uh, when we're doing blood work, we can also measure creatinine levels in the blood. And if there's a high amount, then obviously you're not flushing that out, and there could be a problem somewhere. Okay, so let's just re uh, revisit energy real quick. Okay, so you've got some ATP that's just hanging out in the muscles that can give you quick energy, like boom, boom, boom. As soon as I run out of ATP... Because it's unstable, I have a whole bunch of ADP. But in order to use that ADP, I need creatine phosphate. Okay, So creatine phosphate will give that extra phosphate to ADP and become ATP. And then I've got about 10 seconds, 10 to 15 seconds worth of energy. Now, let's say I want to go a little bit longer. I want to play some basketball. I want to play some soccer. I need, obviously, more than 10 seconds quick movements. Well, this is when glucose comes in. Right, you know, glucose, good old glucose, little uh, sugar here, little carbs. Um, so we take the glucose from the blood, and obviously insulin will allow that. Insulin allows the glucose to go into our muscles, and then with glucose, we obviously have to go through um, a process where we will break down that glucose and convert it into about two ATP. Okay. Now, when we break down glucose, we actually produce a toxic element called pyruvate. 
And since it's toxic, we want to get rid of it. So we quickly uh, uh, want to get rid of that pyruvate. But we also have something called lactate that tends to uh, uh, accumulate. So when, when we're breaking down glucose, we'll get a byproduct called pyruvate. We can get lactate. Okay, so people confuse lactate and lactic acid. Um, the, the true breakdown is actually lactate uh, um, and then a, a bunch of hydrogen ions. Um, and hydrogen ions, yeah, when there's an increase in hydrogen ions, that causes the pH to go down, become acidic, and that's what can cause that burn. Um, so when you're working out, people say, oh, I have lactic acid buildup. You actually have lactate plus hydrogen ions, which cause the pH to drop, and then you get that burning sensation. And like, like creatinine, which was a byproduct we wanted to flush out, when we break down glucose, we actually get a byproduct of lactate. And we want to get rid of that lactate, so we send that back to the, the blood. Now, the body is pretty good at if we need lactate, they'll send it to the liver, and the liver can kind of use that as energy. Um, so it, it, it can use lactate in a positive sense as well. But if there's excess, then we can pee it out. Um, Okay, so our main source of energy, we go and we can go from ATP for three sec seconds, then we go to creatine phosphate for 10 to 15 seconds. Longer than that, we start to break down glucose. Now, if you play soccer, if you play basketball, the brain says, you know what? This person needs uh, glucose every once in a while. So instead of trying to break it down, it's gonna store glucose in muscles. And stored glucose in muscles is known as glycogen. So if I do play soccer, if I do play basketball, I don't have to wait for you to uh, consume some glucose. I can have it broken down quickly, and it gives me energy. And how does that happen? Well, the body's pretty smart. It says this person plays soccer, this person plays basketball. Uh, uh, through training, it will start to store some glycogen into your muscles, and it will break it down when it needs it. So uh, very, very uh, smart your body is. You don't even have to tell it what to do. Um, but let's say you want to you run out of glucose. Then where am I gonna get energy? Well, if I burn through my ATP, if I burn through my uh, creatine phosphate, and if I burn through uh, my glucose, then all that's left is fat, right? So this is why cardiovascular exercise, uh, in order for you to really lose fat or burn fat, you have to do what? Burn through all your energy sources and then rely on triglycerides for your main source of fuel and triglycerides are very efficient um, so once you start burning fat for, uh, uh, for fuel you can go hours okay so fats are very efficient but in order for you to get to the fat burning you have to burn through ATP you have to burn through your creatinine and you have to burn through your glucose reserves uh, uh, and glycogen and then start using uh, triglycerides okay let's say you burn through all that boom 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 and you have no more fat to burn uh, well, in America, you're not ever going to use protein as your fuel source. But in uh, developing countries where kids are starving, they can actually start breaking down muscle and use muscle, proteins, and amino acids for fuel source. Uh, but again, uh, most of us in America will never have to do that. Um, so what I'm getting at is you probably are eating way more protein than you actually need, um, unless you're the rock and you're just destroying your muscles um, you need protein to build and repair but unless you're really working out hard you don't need as much protein as uh, advertised okay so in order for uh, yeah I think you get if you just eat a balanced diet you will definitely get your uh, source of protein one way or another okay so keep that in mind so hopefully uh, this helps now just uh, uh, just to kind of go into more detail now, that was like an introduction. You're like, well, Patel, that was like an eight minute introduction. I know, I'm sorry, uh, but it is a, um, it is something that is a little bit complicated. So I had to go a little bit more in detail, but hopefully that made sense. So just to kind of go back to what our main sources of ATP is, well, you have some existing ATP. You store small amounts of ATP. That's again, less than two to three seconds. Uh, one muscle fiber has 15 billion myosin uh, filaments, and each one utilizes about 2,500 ATP molecules. Oh, okay, so that's a lot of uh, energy, a lot of ATP that's needed. So through something called direct phosphorylation, 
uh, using creatine phosphate, anaerobic, not efficient. So anaerobic means without oxygen. I'm going to get about 3 to 15 seconds um, worth of energy out. That's that creatine that I was telling you about. Now, all these seconds, they vary and they overlap. So if you say, hey, you said three seconds last time, you said six seconds, well, it's going to give you a general idea. So it's not like this, you know, as soon as two seconds are up, all of a sudden your ATP is or There's like this time frame that, uh, and one overlaps. So all these steps overlap each other. So it's not like all of a sudden three seconds are up. Okay, I'm in creatine now. Uh, uh, two seconds are up. My ATP. It's, it's going to vary among individuals. It's going to vary. Um, so they give you this time frame of three to 15 seconds, two to six seconds. Um, but as far as the test is concerned, you will know exactly what kind uh, uh, and when and the, based on the activity that I described. So creatine is found at three to six times ATP used to convert ADP back into ATP. Right? I told you ADP is adeno di phosphate. ATP is adeno tri. So if I have ADP, I need the extra phosphate from creatine phosphate to convert back to ATP. So essentially, creatine gives ADP one of its phosphates to make ATP. Since ATP is unstable, it will be broken down to ATP by a creatine kinase. That's what I was telling you is that we can't just have a whole bunch of ATP just hanging out in our muscles. It's, it's unstable. So it's rapidly used, and then people will definitely supplement with uh, creatine. And uh, one of the things that is commonly found is creatine monohydrate. Um, there's also creatine HCL, which is uh, not as good as creatine monohydrate. So, uh, and most of the research has been on creatine monohydrate. HCL is a, a cheaper version of it. Um, but remember, in order for creatine to work, I mean, a lot of factors have to go right. I mean, let's say you take the creatine. It's got to be broken down into the stomach, then the small intestine. Small intestine absorb into the bloodstream, and then the bloodstream takes it to the muscle cells. And then the, hopefully the muscle cells will uh, uh, be able to use that creatine. So a lot of factors have to go in in order for us to use the creatine that we supplement with. And there's some good products out there that have been that tested. But remember, to get down to the cellular level, a lot of factors have to. So with all supplements, whether it be creatine, uh, you name it, turmeric, uh, any of those kind of things, it, there's a lot of factors uh, that have to go into play to make sure that it's going down to the cellular level. Uh, if it doesn't go down to the cellular level, or if it doesn't reach the muscle or the cells it's supposed to do, it's just a wash. And remember, the supplement uh, industry, there's no real regulation unless somebody dies. So unless somebody has a side effect or somebody has that, I mean, you and I can make up a supplement and um, hopefully it works. Obviously, there's some checks and balances, um, but it's not going to be to the point where it's FDA approved, right? Remember, supplements are not FDA approved. FDA is very stringent and they will make sure that they're, uh, it does what it's supposed to. Whereas supplements, it's kind of the wild, wild west. Good luck, all right? Okay, so now you probably heard of something called cellular respiration back from uh, biology. And this is where we're gonna take glucose and convert it to energy. And we call that glycolysis. And that's gonna give us, I think I told you from the first one, about 30 to 45 seconds worth of energy. So it breaks down glucose, right? So how do you get glucose? Carbs, donuts, whatever, stickers, bar, into two pyruvic acid. Pyruvic acid will lose its hydrogen ion and become something called pyruvate, okay? Then NAD plus is reduced to NADH plus hydrogen ion. So remember, the accumulation of these hydrogen ions, okay, is going to decrease the pH and it's going to cause that burning sensation. So uh, um, in essence, Increased hydrogen ions is what will actually cause this burning sensation. So glycolysis uh, uh, is going to net us a gain of 2 ATP, which is not bad. Um, you actually gain 4, but you have to use 2 in the process, so you only net 2. Um, if you use glycogen, then it yields 3 ATP because you stored that glycogen. And how do you store that? With training in soccer. Following the anaerobic phase, which is this phase, there's a bridge phase that converts pyruvate into something called acetylcoenzyme A. Now people will supplement with acetylcoenzyme A as well. You can see that on the, some of the supplement stores, they have that. Um, but acetylcoenzyme A doesn't give us any ATP. That's just taking that pyruvate and we're going to go down into the Krebs cycle. Okay. 
Now, each molecule of acetyl-CoA will go through the Krebs cycle, as I mentioned. There's eight steps to the Krebs cycle. So, um, again, you're re revisiting biology uh, um, and yield another two molecules of ATP. So, glycolysis gave us two. The Krebs cycle will give us two. And you get something like the UPS trucks, as I like to call them, and their carriers. And the carriers are known as NADH and FADH2. And what they're going to do is they're going to carry these electrons. Uh, they're going to carry hydrogen to the electron transport chain. And via the electron transport chain involves the transfer of these electrons from the hydrogen atoms and the carriers, NAD plus and FAD8, because they're going to carry the hydrogen. So that's how NAD plus becomes NADH and FAD becomes FADH2 because they're carrying these hydrogen ions to oxygen through a series of oxidation and reduction reactions. So you're like, oh my gosh, this is chemistry now? But this transfer through a gradient of chytochromes, which are proteins, generate ATP because hydrogen includes an enzyme called ATP synthase. And this enzyme uses the gradient to synthesize ATP from ADP and phosphate. Right? Inorganic phosphate. That's what the PI says, but inorganic phosphate. So this will net us a net total of 26 to 28 ATP. 26 in the muscle, uh, skeletal muscles, and 28 in the cardiac muscles. Okay, so that's why you get that 26 to 28 molecules. So we get a total of, grand total of 30 to 32 ATP, uh, two to glycolysis, two to Krebs, and anywhere from 26 to 28 in the electron transport chain to make that. So again, this requires, this requires mitochondria. So aerobic respiration, which is what I just took you through, requires aerobic respiration, requires oxygen, and only takes place in mitochondria. Whereas the first two steps of um, creatine phosphate and the glycolysis, that occurred in, outside the mitochondria in the cytoplasm. Um, so remember, we always call the mitochondria the powerhouse of the cell. Well, now you know why, because it requires oxygen and it's going to power and it's going to give us 30 to 32 ATP, which is good. You know, that gives us sustained energy. So energy for muscle fiber contraction comes from molecules of ATP, which is what we've been talking about. This chemical is in limited supply and must be regenerated. The initial source of energy for muscle contraction is ATP that is stored in the muscle. Creatine phosphate is present to initially generate ATP from ADP and phosphate and also contains high energy bonds. Whenever the supply of ATP is sufficient, the enzyme creatine phosphocanase promotes the synthesis of creatine phosphate. So as ATP decomposes, the energy from creatine phosphate can be transferred to ATP molecules, converting it then back to ATP, which is what we've been talking about, but uh, sometimes it's best to hear it three or four times. And the creatine phosphate is rapidly used up too, and as the supply declines, the cell must rely on cellular respiration to generate ATP, right? So my first source was ATP, but because it's unstable, uh, we only have a few seconds, uh, two to three seconds of using that ATP. Then we're going to kick in our creatine phosphate, right? Give us maybe three to 15 seconds of energy. But let's say we burn through and we're actually working out more than 15 seconds. Well, then I need to use cellular respiration and go into glycolysis and get maybe 45 seconds worth of energy. So this is my basketball players and my soccer players, okay? But if I'm gonna do prolonged energy, my, like endurance running, then I gotta burn through ATP, creatine phosphate, glucose, and then I'll start burning fat as my fuel source, which is more efficient, okay? Uh, when uh, ATP levels are high, uh, you can see uh, that we're using creatine, creatine phosphate, will give ATP, ADP, ATP. When ATP is low, well, guess what? Creatine phosphate is going to give that phosphate and give it to ATP, convert ADP to ATP. Okay, so that's what you want to uh, realize that, hey, if it's too high, then I'm just going to take the ATP phosphate. I'm going to make ADP and give that phosphate to creatine. Well, when the ATP is low, well, I have creatine phosphate, and I'm going to add that. I'm going to take that extra phosphate 
and give it to ADP and convert it to ATP. So this is constantly happening. Okay, this should read creatinine. Creatinine is unstable. Um, so glycolysis is the first phase of cellular respiration. It is anaerobic and occurs in the cytoplasm. Glycolysis is an incomplete breakdown of glucose and yields two ATP per molecule of glucose. Aerobic respiration, which is with us oxygen, is complete breakdown of glucose. It is aerobic, requires oxygen, occurs in the mitochondria. Aerobic respiration yields 28 ATP per molecule of glucose. And you've heard of hemoglobin, right? Hemoglobin in red blood cells carries oxygen to muscle tissue, so we need that. And the pigment myoglobin stores oxygen in muscle tissue for aerobic respiration. This increases oxygen availability. So here's the overview of cellular respiration. So here's glucose, right? Glucose uh, from carbs. Um, and when it's broken down, it's going to give us... 2 ATP, and then pyruvic acid will turn into pyruvate and lactic acid. And see, this sometimes the uh, the book still uses the word lactic acid, but it really is lactate. Uh, and the newer research shows that it is technically lactate. Uh, um, okay, and what we'll do is we'll take the pyruvic acid and use an enzyme called coenzyme A, and we'll go through something called the Krebs cycle, which is about eight steps. And the Krebs cycle gives us about 2 ATP. And then we have these carriers, NAD plus and FAD, which will take these hydrogen ions and take them to the electron transport chain. And we're going to get something called a combination of water, energy, and we're going to synthesize ATP. Remember the, uh, uh, we needed oxygen, of course. Remember in the first phase of using creatine, the byproduct was creatinine. So we had to flush that out, right? So that's bad. When we use glucose, we turned it to a uh, toxic pyruvate and lactate, which we had to get rid of the lactate. Well, if we use aerobic respiration, we use oxygen, right? And the byproduct of that is going to be carbon dioxide. So we're going to have to get rid of carbon dioxide and we breathe out carbon dioxide because that's the toxic part. So the three things that were bad that we had to get rid of were creatinine, lactate, and carbon dioxide. So those are all byproducts and things that are uh, bad for the body and they get rid of that. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. Um, let's stop there and then we'll talk about oxygen depth.